It's a, it's a panel about celebrating our lives, particularly special lives of people who happen to be refugees from different countries. And I'm delighted to say I have people from three countries who are able to share their stories from, say, Bosnia. I've got two sisters, Dudia and Nazira from Bosnia. I've got brother Aziz from East Turkestan, Uyghur from so-called China. And then I've got brother Ahmad from Syria, correct? I will read out their biographies as short information about them so you can learn more about the background. And then simply, we're going to just share our stories together. And then later, what is it like now living in England at this moment in time? So on my right, or left rather, <laughs> I'll start off with uh, brother Aziz Isa Elkun. Now, he was born in East Turkestan, which is now part of China. He graduated from Xi'an University, majoring in Chinese and Russian and languages. He has been living in London since 2001. He studied in Burbank University in London. He has published many poems, stories, and research articles in both the Uyghur language he worked, and in English. He worked as a research assistant on the Sounding Islam China project based in SOAS, University of London. He has conducted collaborative fieldwork in Central Asia for the project from September 2018. He has been a worker as a researcher on a British Academy sustainable development project about Uyghur Meshrap, is that correct? Yes, yeah. Correct. In Kazakhstan, based at SOAS, University of London. He is an active member of the exile Uyghur community and founder of a Uyghur music group called the London Uyghur Ensemble. So ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you, Aziz. Please, a round of applause. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Next to me, I have a dear sister, Dudia. She's very special to me, but she's written some notes. I'm going to read out her notes about her. She said, you do my biography. <laughs> I said, no, you have to write it. So these are some notes. My name is Dudia, and this is lovely writing. Remember, this is a second language. I was born in Bosnia. When I was born, Bosnia was a communist country. I grew up in the countryside where my family worked in farming and agriculture. I'm the oldest of six children, and from an early age, I helped my parents on the farm. At seven years old, I started school, and we studied the history of my country, including under the Soviet Union, such as Lenin, Stalin, and Marx. We were not allowed to study our religion. My mom was born to a religious family, and my father was Muslim, but a communist. My mom would have to hide her religious practices because my father would lose his job if they found out. In 1992, a war broke out in Bosnia, so I had to leave my country because without warning, they attacked Muslims and my country was under siege. I was working in Bosnia, I was married and had two children who were three and seven when they had to leave. I had an ordinary life in Bosnia and a happy life until the war started. What she's forgotten to mention is she's a brilliant chef. She was working as a chef in Bosnia. So this is Dudia Zilic, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> a very dear sister, I keep saying, I'm afraid I'm biased. <laughs> okay, next to me is my wonderful brother, and I'm delighted to host you because we really wanted somebody from Syria. Ahmed Mujahid Nayab is a computer science teacher at UK High School, and he's also a volunteer to support refugees in Northwest. He moved to the UK in 2015. He holds a computer engineering degree, Master of Business Administration, and a PGCA. If you don't know what that means, it stands for Postgraduate Certificate in English. And I have a PGC, and I know how important that is, how hard it is getting, and especially for a second language learner. So well done, you. I'm really proud of you. <laughs> Ahmed's father was a political prisoner for nine years in Syria, and he will talk more about that. So, ladies and gentlemen, Ahmed, okay? <laughs> so, last not least, my dear, dear sister, Nazira, who's another darling sister of mine, sister of the dear. I've known her for how many years, Nazira? Oh, oh.
how old is your daughter? 27. 27. She was pregnant with her daughter when I first met her. 27 years I've known these ladies. They were girls then. <laughs> this is what she's written. My name is Nazira Kohadzik. I was born in a big Bosnian family. I am one of six children. My father worked in agriculture. My mother was a housewife. I finished law at school, got married, had my first daughter. I worked in a furniture factory while my husband was in an iron factory. We lived in Sarajevo before the war broke out. So ladies and gentlemen, my lovely sister Nazira. <laughs> and I'm delighted to say Nazira at my behest, at my sort of request, is wearing her national costume. So I'm really delighted. So let's start off then. So what we're now going to do is literally share our stories. What was it like? Shall I stay with you sisters first? We, could, we cover Bosnia and then we can go to country. So everybody will have five minutes each. And I, if you go over, I just signal to you and then we move on. So sister Dudi, I'll start with you first of all. We've, we've talked about this so many times. It's normal for you now to do this. So tell us what was life like before the war and then what actually happened? How did it happen and what, how did you escape? I want first say thank you for uh, uh, give me a chance. I feel when I talk about that like my therapy, I am uh, glad met a person like Kesra and who really work very hard and which she encouraged me to do the same. You know, uh, she already said, in Bosnia was communist system, everybody work, everybody, you know, been uh, same, same culture, same food, same, uh, actually even marriage was many, mixed marriage. <laughs> you know, with different uh, uh, religion, and just, you know, uh, suddenly, without warning what she already read, you know, one morning I go to work and, and they put barricade on my uh, uh, job. And I saw my neighbor, and I thought he joking. I said, what you doing here? He said, go back. Because really, really, <coughs> we no, nobody expecting, nobody even know any clue how, what will be happening. When I come back, my sister been in Sarajevo, 50 kilometers far from our town, and Sarajevo already been in siege, and we don't know anything there, what happening. Then. Actually, you know, I realize I have to leave. I have to just move where I lived all my life, where I've been educated, where I work. That is. And then what happened? Uh, oh. I first thought, I will go maybe a few days because uh, uh, my husband work in Croatia and also my sister live in Croatia. I said I will go there <laughs> for a few days until we thought maybe they will negotiate. Yes, negotiate. Thank you. And I was a teacher once. <laughs> uh, she's my first teacher actually. I forgot to tell you. You know, uh, uh, I will tell you when I came here, really, she said, you have to learn English. I said, no, I don't want to learn English. I won't go back to my country. I want my life, how I live. She said, no, no, you don't know how long you stay here. I said, my God, what's she talking? <laughs> and from that time, even she took me in her car and she took me to her, her school. She gave me dictionary. She said, learn word by word. I said, easy for me, Russian, because we learn Russian in, 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 in Bosnia, second language. But I think so, uh, what Kesra said is was true. She must know. She must be know what, okay. what will be. OK, to go back to your story, so uh, what, remember what happened then? You know what uh, was, I go to, uh, 
village, my mom look after my son. And my daughter also been in, in with uh, my husband family. I go pick up my son, then I pick up my daughter, and then I walk. Already uh, all, uh, you know, was uh, buses stop, all traveling uh, uh, was stopped. I start walk, not just with my two children, I have even sister child. Her, her daughter been with my mom. And I just tell mom, I said something is not right. She said, look, take your sister daughter too. I said, what I will do with, uh, with her daughter because you, you don't know where you're going. She told me, she said, look, Dudia, you know, take children, even if I've been killed, maybe they will one day say story. Mm -hmm. They will maybe witness one day what happening here. And I will never forget how I have hard to leave my mom alone. My father just passed away before one year. And I took three children. Mom gave me some bread and something I, even I forgot. And was actually summer start in Bosnia, very hot. And I start travel with three of them. And I walk and walk, I not see anything. I don't know even where I will go. After maybe, maybe a good 22, 25 miles, um, lorry passing, I just left my hand and he recognized me. I recognized him, he was chauffeur of my company. And I said, where are you going? He's he looking me with three children. He know I have children. He said, I'm going to Croatia. I said, please, can you take us? He said, Dudi, I am full. He said, you know, I can't take you on bag. I have some timber. Mm -hmm. I said, put us on top of timber. He said, OK, but how you will uh, go to, you know, we go to, I remember I put my son with him was one space, but he said one space will be, I picking somebody else a little further. And that is, was my journey, take me from Bosnia to Croatia full four days, without food, without water. And when we start leaving, then uh, uh, more like shelling, bombing, noisy. He just put radio on, on his uh, uh, cabin so loud. He said, pray to God uh, we, we, we escape. You know, I just, uh, uh, believe me, I not prayed before. I not been even uh, practicing. Yes, my mom was a woman from very religious family, but we been more do what the rest of people <coughs> do. We, we, that is, you know, and uh, they taking us many, maybe after one, two miles, they checking. Yeah. They took us, they said, take out our timber, where you going, why are you going, and they know why we, I said, look, my husband working, I going to visit my husband and my sister in, in Croatia. And that is, was really hard journey. This is, I will never forget. Children was uh, crying, hungry. Children need water and uh, he stopped on one place. And I just come out and looking, is it anything from tree or like, you know, to take. And one lady just uh, coming to near me and she look at me. I embarrassed to ask her, I know maybe even they not have, I said, do, do you have maybe give us just a bottle of water? She not respond anything. I said, oh, even she ignore us. She go back and she came back with a piece of bread and a, a bottle of water. I gave two children water and that bread and I been like I ate. I just feel 
if they stop crying, it will be nice of, of even, you know, man who, who, who is. And when we reach to Croatia, you know, uh, my sister, I don't know, probably because Croatia people know what happening. Her, uh, she, her husband came and, you know, I've been face never washed for four days. Imagine in, in, in small places. And she, he took us. And when we came to my sister's flat, her flat already full. When we enter, you can't uh, pass because people take off shoes, you know, in Croatia and Bosnia. I said, oh, uh, you know, my sister said, don't worry, rest, then we will do something, and which is really a big, big help. Then we rest, we stay overnight, I don't know where we sleep that night. Then I told my brother-in-law, uh, and I told him, I said, do you mind take me my husband's uh, office where he worked, but that time he'd been in Russia. And he took me there and I told them, I said, I not have any proof I am his wife. I told, I just have an identity of my daughter. I said, this is uh, his child, I am his wife. Can any chance to contact him? Because I thought to ask him uh, what I will do, I, shall I go join to him or where I will go? And that is. Okay. Thank you, Dudio. Can I just ask, uh, just in a short way, if you can, why do you think the war started? What was behind it? What, what do you think? What's your belief? Uh, Be honest, you, you know what is, even this day I asking myself why. When somebody asks me, you know when people, uh, before talk, like my mom lost in, in Second World War both parents. Her father been, uh, 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 you know, killed. His mother died, I don't know, after uh, five months. We always uh, uh, think never again, never again. You know, when mom talk, we always say, mom, please not talk sad story. You know, not, uh, not, but I think so repeating mm. to me, I think so, you know what I mean, especially uh, my country in one century, three times war, mm. uh, not understand me wrong, uh, you know what is, I ask myself, if I not pray, if I not practice, if I not uh, do anything, I been like them, close everything, why they do that, or what is reason they do that? You have I said it was a name, being a Muslim? I think so, because just of name. I think so, because just of name. We not have anything different than them, than just name. Okay, thank you so much, Dadia, for sharing your personal story. Your surname is Serb surname as well. Your husband surname. Same as Serb surname. Okay. Because it matters a lot for Bosnian Hads. Yes. Over uh, to you, Nazira. You tell us same Sibyl. I'm sorry, I am interrupting, no, but no, no, it's, no, it does matter. We finish, yes. So, Nazira, over to you. You, in your case, you were actually pregnant, nine months pregnant when you came. I'll never yeah. forget that. It for you, it was even more of a terrible time. So, tell us how you were, what happened to you on your journey. It was very difficult. Thank you very much, everybody, to listening. I am Dudia's sister. I was in Sarajevo when war started, 92. I know, is it, is it microphone on? Yeah, okay. I uh, was in, in Sarajevo with my husband, and uh, war started. I remember when, uh, I remember when uh, uh, it was Eid, and uh, Karadzic mentioned uh, that is be bloody eat this year in April. And uh, President Alia of Bosnia elected. And he said, uh, for war we need two, uh, two people. We are not going to fight. We need two people to fight. We are for peace, we are for talk. We are not going to fight. 
and we thought, and he mentioned how you can put the bomb here, that is not everybody injured. And we thought as well, but really it's possible they have evacuated people, Serbs people, over the night. They told them, Serbs people have to go to the mountain where they already was putting uh, heavy weapons and whoever stayed loyal to Bosnian government, they will not be protected, even them, we will kill them. And they have the uh, pro statistic that maybe in a month they will uh, finish, uh, demolish Sarajevo and demolish all uh, uh, Bosnia. When you demolish uh, Sarajevo, that is, they, uh, Sarajevo was already sieged uh, on the beginning. And uh, on the that, it was more frightening uh, things when they start bombarding and people start be, be killed uh, in April. And worse things, when presi Bosnian President Alia went to meeting to the Europe, I think it was in Austria, and he, when he came back, he couldn't land it. They said uh, Serbs army occupied uh, uh, Europe, uh, airport and they uh, uh, warning him go back to Austria go to Europe and he mentioned he said no my people is there I am no, not leaving people without me and they he, uh, aeroplane landed and they catched President Alia that that time was more frightened things that we thought really what is Karadzic said that is in a month will be Sarajevo demolished and people will be killed. And that we prayed, everybody prayed and scared what is going on. And they manage uh, how is with uh, Bosnian territorial army. We didn't have army, we had territorial army. That territorial army managed to blockade one uh, uh, Serbs uh, base, where was Bosnian base, uh, base army. And they told them, they was very important general in that base. If you not, we have to exchange President Alia for that army and that general. How did it uh, happen? And thanks, thanks to God that his uh, president was survived, that they didn't uh, kill him. A secondly time when I, uh, Sarai was sieged, uh, grenade from uh, aeroplane, from the, the heavy weapons, from, the, uh, from everywhere, from the corner. Sarai will fight from corner by corner, from the street, from the street. When the second time uh, uh, was, uh, I am scared, I have to leave. I fe felt pregnant, I didn't have any option, no food, no, only you can see. Sorry, people killed. I still smell flesh. Oh, oh, I am terrified. You couldn't move anywhere that you know stand on somebody's hand, on somebody's head, on somebody's leg. I'm sorry. But when I have to go out of Sarajevo, it was 95% that you're going to be killed, 5% that you will survive, but you didn't have chance, I didn't have any option. I am going to die anywhere if I am staying in Sarajevo or taking chance. It's only 5% chance that I will survive. We travel, wait all night. We have only one chance go to the forest, through the forest, but in one, uh, uh, they knew where is, uh, we can go out. And they particularly bombarding 24 hours that place because they have chance to kill even people. That is for civilians who want to leave uh, Bosnia, Sarajevo. And we wait up to night, late at night, two o'clock in the morning that we go past uh, that place and walking, hiding behind them. Uh, they advised us, go 
uh, after maybe five, ten minutes, don't go all together. If one killed, they bombarding already. They knew that we are passing. And uh, we went there. I traveled to Croatia from Bosnia uh, for f three days. I was uh, pregnant. I didn't have anything. I, when I came to my sister, they couldn't recognize me. I couldn't. You, when I saw her, really, you know, I said, is it Nazira? You know, her face totally changed. And I said, what happening? Because, and she just cry she no say one word she then we by chance thanks god again to to god and take uh, to to my sister dudia she was always always very wise and very on front to everybody and she heard somebody saying oh nobody want to go to england she said what are you talking about i have uh, one coach full of people can you see my sister pregnant can you see these old people? I have one coach full for, for going to, to anyway evacuate us from uh, there. We, 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 mount, uh, we nearly on the street. They gave her one uh, uh, room where is, uh, you know, we have to put the newspaper, whole, whole uh, is there. It's winter, October, is winter is coming in Croatia and it's cold. And she said, can you see our children? And can you see elderly? Can you see this? And she went to that. They said, okay, give us name. How we travel? In October, we came to Manchester. When we came to Manchester, and they told us, you know, we a few times stay in the first time when we came to Disbury Mosque, when we saw food, when I saw food, real food. I couldn't believe, I said, oh, is that food? That is, I missed for four, six months in, in Bosnia, I didn't, even if we had something, I had my neighbor who had two children, and I will hide that we, when we're going to basement, that our children will be eat, because is, they can starve. I remember I went one time in a, on the, under the grenade. She didn't have any milk to knocking God my, somebody who I know that have cow. And she said, I can't get out. I said, can I go to, to pull milk from the cow? Baby screaming, we haven't got anything. I risk even my life to feed that baby. And that baby is, I left them in Sarajevo. I never know what has happened. And when we came here, when I'm so food, and the life started changing differently. And they offering us, start offering us uh, houses. And everybody from Bosnia, they said, oh, no, 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 we are not signing anything. We are only for three months here. We won't go back to Bosnia. We have our life. We have our job, our, our house. We are thought Europe will sort it out, Milosevic and take it uh, out that uh, dictator and we will go to Bosnia. We are an independent country. We, we have a Bosnian flag in the uh, United Nations. We have you know, in uh, Europe a uh, Bosnian flag. Uh, what is the reason that we're not coming back? Only the dictator and uh, take it out. That is, we thought that is simple. And they said, oh, we think, you think that is like that, but don't think you have to stay better. And up to now, we are here. Okay. We have now children we and everything. Children. We'll talk about your life in a minute. Thank okay. you so much. Uh, you've, heard, you've, heard these, you've heard these poignant stories of my dear sisters. In case some of you people have joined us and you don't know anything about Bosnia, uh, is it 25 years ago? How many years ago? The Sabrinica. How many years? Is it 25 years this year? 25 years. I've specially chose this panel, our stories, to celebrate Remember Srebrenica. I'm one of his champions. I went to myself to Bosnia. Unlike my sister was in tears, I still remember one scene. I, they showed us a video. Basically, 8,000 men were killed and boys and, uh, and fathers, uncles, because they were Muslims. And there's a short video of a father and son. They escaped into the forest, and the father is calling his son. He's saying, 
Narmeen, come down, we are safe. Because those neighbors tricked them. They said, come out, come out, we'll save you. But what the father didn't realize, he was calling Narmeen back out and they would be killed. And that's exactly what happened. We talked to women who to this day are looking for a finger, an arm, and a leg because they put them all over the place. And that is a tragedy of living with this. So what poor sister said, they have lived these lies. So I just want to give you a flavor of Bosnia. I need to move on because of time. So equally poignant I have on my left, Brother Aziz. I was very, very keen to feature the Uyghur community, and I really want, and I was so lucky that I came across the name of Brother Aziz, and it's thanks to Arkin, who's been here with us. And Aziz gave me his bio, he sent me a link, and you know what, he sent me his poem as well. And that poem, remember I read it, touched me to my soul, and he will talk about that experience. A son who cannot call his mother back home because a mother is too afraid to pick up the phone because if she picks up the phone, they might go to prison. What kind of life is this? Because we live safely in England in this sort of world, we can't fathom what these people have gone through. So, ladies and gentlemen, over to you, Aziz, to share your story, your experience of oppression, escape from your situation. Uh, thank you, Kaisara uh, sister, and thank you, uh, our audience. Uh, yes, uh, I briefly introduce who am I and whom I'm what I'm going to talk. I'm talking about the Uyghur people, about their sufferings. I'm a member of the Uyghur ethnic group. And Uyghurs are, uh, Uyghurs are Turkic people, uh, live in Central Asia, and their country called East Turkestan. And China occupied that country in 1949 and uh, labeled that region <coughs> Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. And Uyghurs are around 20 million population and uh, lived uh, in that region for uh, many centuries. So I am a member of that community and the Uyghur Autonomous Region is north of Tibet and the uh, northwestern region of contemporary China. Yes, um, many of you are aware this uh, Mao Zedong was, uh, it was uh, Chinese Communist Party's leader and one of the most brutal dictator. He even killed more people than Stalin, around 78 million people. Really? And it's the inside story of Mao Zedong, there's a book written about him. Why I'm talking about this, I was born right in the middle of the Cultural Revolution. You know, Chinese Cultural Revolution started in 1966, ended in 1976. I was born in 1970. What's my early memory is, there's not enough food to eat, no, no clothes to wear. And <coughs> just starvation. And, uh, I, yes, of course, I was born in a Muslim family, but there's no sign of mosque, anything. They turned all the mosque to animal farm. All the intellectuals, all the religious uh, people who practice religion, religion in that time, all sent to camps or, or just labor camps. And now, they're exactly repeating that, that tragedy in East Turkestan since 2017. I will talk about later on. So I was born, that was my memory. Uh, thanks my father, my beloved father, he died. Uh, 2017, I was not able to go his funeral or anything. And uh, I got to CNN inclusive uh, interview two weeks ago. 2000, Last year in May, I found from the Google Earth, even my father's tomb was destroyed by the Chinese state. My father was able to stay in his tomb for only 623 days. So I have never seen my father's 
I was not able to go to his funeral. In, even I don't know where my father's remains or tomb. I don't know, nothing, no idea. So now I get back again. So I thanks for my f- beloved father. He was caring about uh, my education. He worked very hard to educate me. I was uh, able to go to university. I graduated university in 1991. I was act member, student member. When I was, many of you know, but uh, Chinese student uh, protest in 1989, Tiananmen student uh, protest, which was oppressed by Tang in Beijing. I was as university student that time. I was three months protest to the Chinese government to to demand the democracy, freedom of speech. Why I was in Urumqi. And at that time, year early, I was uh, posted or organized a small group of my, my friends at the uh, last year in high school, post, re- wrote a poem and posters put in the headmaster's door and men on the streets, basically we demand uh, equal rights for the Uyghurs and also demand uh, improve Uyghur education and uh, stop the uh, Chinese brute control against Uyghur people. That's finished. I graduated uh, Chinese uh, government's university. Everything's fine. That the uh, Chinese also uh, socialist country. We all learn uh, Marx's uh, secular country. I graduated university in 1991, and they offered me job in the government, very top job, because I can speak that time fluent. We use my mother language. I can speak Russian and Chinese. I was uh, in the kind of foreign affairs department deal with the Central Asian people who travel, issuing the visa or giving permit, that kind of very, very top job they offered me. And uh, yes, I worked <laughs> for that uh, position. Six months later, they said, uh, now your probation period ended and now we stopped you, f- you from working for the government. We found you are hiding your history. You were at the university. You staged, you participated protests against Chinese government, and you also encouraged splitism, spreadism about Uyghur nationalism. Well, so they hung me for two years, and then finally they couldn't arrest me, but instead they fired me from my official job. Since then, our, around uh, 10 years, I was um, jobless. I became a kind of private teacher, teaching uh, Russian language, Chinese language. I just sang, but whenever uh, kind of anything happened, any movement happened, I would be first person to target to call for question or harassment. Yes, I left, managed to left in 1999 to Kyrgyzstan. I stayed in Kyrgyzstan for one year, and uh, thanks to my Uyghur community in Europe, they helped me a lot. I got a French visa with a different identity, and I, yeah, I then traveled to, uh, to France and the UK. So now, uh, what I remember now, uh, it's if I didn't left in 1999, there will be no one to speak about on behalf of my, my people. If I didn't leave my country, I will be one of the, my friends, among the, one of the, my friends, like I've been in the, in the Chinese concentration camp. And many of my classmates, friends, academic friends, my poet friends, friends, I don't know, two, three years, including my mother, no communication, I cannot talk to anyone. When I feel like hearing our uh, sisters and brothers' stories, Yes, people can call to Syria, war zone. People can call to Afghanistan, war zone. Bosnia, no problem. But I cannot call to my, fam- my family. Not only me, the many Uyghur community members here. They block at all the communication for the Uyghurs from home and abroad. Even the journals are not allowed to go. And now we confirm it. United Nations also confirmed there's more than 3 million Uyghur, which is Chinese citizen. They are locked up in the camp, we can call concentration camp. And again, I want to say, genocide not happened overnight. Overnight. Look, this is one of the examples of Bosnia. At that time, Europe didn't listen to it. 
it's going to happen, they didn't listen to it. And the Holocaust in the Second World War in Germany also didn't happen overnight. Yes, so we have to remember never again. And now this approved, there's a casual genocide taking place already. The, my father told one of the example. Now physical genocide also taking place, we don't know. What's the level? What's the how much the the, the, the fatality of the of the vicious uh, system, vicious uh, the policies Chinese government uh, doing towards the Uyghur people at the moment? Right, thank, you. thank you. So finally, Brother Ahmed, you tell us about your experience. Uh, you come from Syria. Yeah. So what ha happened to you or your family? Yeah. <coughs> well, it is. Uh, a bit has a lot of similarity between our problem with the Chinese regime. In 1968, uh, a military coup seized the control over the country. And then after a few years in 1971, seized the control. So the, we have the new leader, uh, Hafez Assad, the father of the current President of Syria, Bashar al-Assad. In 1971, he controlled the whole aspect of the life of the Syrians, starting from political, social, uh, education, even sport. Like, the leader of sport club should be nominated by the, by the political party who is leading the whole country. So every aspect of your life is controlled by what they call it a leader party. This leader party has the power to intervene in every aspect of in your life. It's quite similar to the Chinese uh, party or the socialist party in the Soviet Union. Because I think they all come from the same school of thought as a unitarian that's one one person control one party and this party control the whole life of the country. Uh, the the bad the dark era on, on uh, the dark era in uh, Syrian life was in 1981 when there was a sort of political opposition for uh, the Syrian regime and at that time within 27 days something happened like Srebrenica but here's the difference is that a Syrian regime killed more than 40,000 citizens in the city of Hama, assuming that he will have uh, this kind of cleansing and he will then seize the control over the whole country. And that's happened. After 1982, nobody was there even to think, not to say, not to act. Action is stopped saying is stop now you can't even dream of having new regime or having any sort of political life and uh, i have a story of one military officer he was he waked up one day and he told his friend that i have a, a sort of dream i don't know how to understand it and he said, what, what was your dream? He said, I saw uh, like a funeral for the president. Our president died and there's a funeral for him. And he's, so his friend was afraid to listen to this dream. And he said, okay, okay, just forget that this is just a dream and don't talk to anyone. A third bar person heard this one minute conversation and by Communicating this conversation to the security officer, both guys were present and died in the prison just because one man has a dream and another share the story of the dream. And the accusation for this, the second person was saying, why you did not inform our security device about his dream? So a dream is an end for two people to be died because of this, the thing about this. My family were in a depraved area and outskirts of 
the city of Aleppo. Um, I'm proud to, be, to say that Aleppo is the oldest inhabited city in the world, according to UNESCO. And uh, in this area, people will have no schools, children and youth tend to be lost in uh, nowhere because of lack of uh, uh, services. And then my father decided, because my father was one of five people out of 20,000 population and at that area we were able to, to reach university level. He was an electrical engineer. So he decided to start like a youth club, just to bring those young people for in a sport, in different sports, just to keep them away from bad action or get involved in a gang act. And because of this sort of uh, gathering, any gathering at that time was considered like a sort of conspiracy against government. If you are gathering for for playing football or gathering for, you know, sharing ideas or doing any sort of gathering, it's a conspiracy against the government. And my father was taken from his home with no charges for nine years. And for, let's say, nine years, nobody of our family has any clue if he's live alive or dead. There was no way to, under, to, to get any sort of information about not only my father, tens of thousands of people who was in a, one of the most brutal prison in the world. Its name was Tadmor. And if you Google it, you will see some horrible story about this prison. After eight years, we could figure out by bribing one officer who passed this information that yes, your father is still alive in this prison. And we could manage to visit him once after eight and a half years. The scenario when we visited him, me, my two brother and one sister, my mother, three uncles and two aunts, when we came to the room where he was in, he started recognizing, he started refreshing his memory to recognize his family. He knows this is his okay, sisters, brothers, wife, children. He has two moments of shock when he said, okay, this young boy, is he my son who I, did, I didn't see? Because when he was present, my mother was pregnant and so he just made a, a guess okay is this, is this boy my son yes he's your son which you never see and then after a few minutes of conversation he came up with another shock which is really made us all of us cry he said well where is my mother i left eight years ago and my mother was with me, living with me in my home. So why she didn't come with you? Nobody has the answer that your mother died because she was crying and she got sick after you were get present. That was a very touching moment. And even when my father was released after nine years, he had the chance to sit for a court after nine years. And they figured out that he was detained by mistake, so he deserved to be released. So when he released, he was denied all his civil rights. He can't get a passport, he can't get any sort of ownership, he can't have any uh, right for election until he aged 50 years old. Because the regime believed that if you are 50 years old, that that's means you are kind of obsolete human. There is no point that you will be used for any action against the government. And when my father dis have the chance to get his passport for the first time, he decided not only to leave this country, so technically we are refugees since nine, 2003, when my father decided to leave his country and 
took all his family one by one to work abroad in a Gulf region. My father stayed there until he died. He never looked back to come back to his country because he knows that this country is not going to give him any sort of dignity and any sort of freedom. It's not only this, that me as a, fam me as a person and all of my family will be labeled like a threat for the national security. Whenever we go f to, s to start any business or to get employed, we could be asked to, to have like a, cert like a DBS certificate here in UK, about a clear, a good contact certificate. And because of my father's history, we never had this certificate released. We were always considered as a betrayer for the country. They would never believe us. Even after a few years of work of in Gulf, when the Syrian uprising, the peaceful uprising which started in 2011, when we think that we might have chance for a change, because this new president, he is a young person, he is a doctor, he, is, he studied in UK, he has this open-minded, we believe that he is not as brutal as his father. Unfortunately, this little monster proved everyone wrong by having more than 600,000 Syrian citizens died for the last nine years. More than eight million Syrian refugees fled out of Syria in neighborhood countries like Turkey, Lebanon, Iraq, and Jordan, and even in Europe and UK. Europe has more than two million Syrian refugees nowadays. Half of them, I think, in Germany. I still criticize UK because they are not taking their, their fair share of refugees. And we reach the point, even if you are Syrian, out of Syria, the Syrian authorities still control your life by denying you to get a passport. And this is a very critical moment for most of the Syrians around the world when they visit their embassy to renew their passport and they say, no, you are not getting to passport because you belong to a family who were a threat for the, our national security 30, day, 30 years ago. And this is a moment where I decided I'm not going to have this experience again. I have a family, I have a children. In 2015, I decided to move to UK and start my new life here with my family. Leave everything behind me. I was, I'm, now I'm, I'm a teacher. When I said to my children about my experience, I've been 11 years back working in Dubai, the first reaction from any English student say, what, Dubai, are you crazy, sir, to leave Dubai and come to, to live here? Well, I can't, understand, I can't explain the whole story why I left Dubai, why I can't get my, uh, my, my, my personal life, even in Dubai, I can't have it the way I like because the Syrian regime can reach me wherever I go until I change my citizenship I changed my uh, status, which is unfortunately now we are in 21st century, and still as a human being, we are always categorized, classified according to our nationality. It's not about you as, as a human being. It's, it's, it's always get down to the point, what is your nationality? Are you American? Then okay, you deserve a respect, you deserve to get freedom of movement, you deserve to get a good work with a good salary. But if you are one of those countries who are considered like a third world, well, you have all the restriction, we are going to stop you in airports now with a new regulation, even if I become a British citizen, still I'm dealt in an airport in, a, in any country as if I am uh, a risk. I didn't choose to be a Syrian, but others choose to make me a risk. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, we have about 20, uh, 15, 20 minutes. We'll spend about just five, seven minutes. 
about life here in the UK for each of you, and then we'll open it to the audience as well to give them a chance to interact with you, to ask them more if they want to. And you're welcome to answer, and if it's too painful or too private, then you don't have to. So first of all, starting with you, Brother Aziz, so what has your life been like in England? You are a poet, you're a filmmaker, you're contributing to you, uh, research in the university, you have family, you have friends. Has it been a positive experience? Uh, as we are refugees, we all know we started new life. We left the old one. It's very, very painful. When I arrived, I was 29. And uh, you know, I cannot speak a word of English. Mm. And I, I found everything's dark. Everything's dark. I don't understand anything. So I decided I have to study. And there will be a very, very difficult time for me, difficult years ahead. Because my family, my friends, everything I left, I lost. I'm going to be newborn again. So we all know this one, how painful. So uh, 10 years, I didn't, I was, yeah, I'm a poet. I did, I did write a lot before that, even though I'm, since I was 15. So I, I, I give my res resolution for myself. I won't write for 10 years in Uyghur, in my mother tongue, unless I was able to write in English in academic level. I didn't write for 10 years in Uyghur. All my poems came after 2010. I didn't separate for 10 years. I, I stayed in three different college and I worked for a, as a teaching assistant. And then since 2015, uh, Homos offered me a job and I will work for immigration service as an interpreter. And even now until I'm working, on, I'm one of the oldest immigration Service interpreter. That's what I have two, three different jobs now. I graduated from Brickback University, multimedia web development. I have, for example, if I have five websites, I have to also, I'm admin. I know everything gets dedicated for the Uyghur people, for the academic. So, yes, uh, I do believe hard work always reward. Uh, such a uh, such a country we live, we are very privileged, we are very proud to be British. And uh, if you are in the right direction, if you want to study, there's many, many opportunities. I want to tell the young uh, or your youngsters. Uh, so you have to be just willing to be kept with the hardship. And uh, you can change your destination, you can change what you want to be. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, that's all. I want to tell. <laughs> okay. Now, do the end, just two minutes uh, each. <laughs> we've just been told we've got 10 minutes left, but I do want the audience to have a chance as well. So tell us what life, I know your life, but it's nice to share it, and I know it's been positive. <laughs> and by the way, I've got to tell you, I'm very biased in the sense I've known this sister. She knows everybody. Most of Manchester knows Dudia. <laughs> That's the thing she can say. So tell me about your story, about your friendship. <laughs> I will a little, I don't know what you want to tell me. I will just say, not a uh, joke, because when I came here, I couldn't speak English. And I remember, uh, you know, when they move us in uh, Longside, because of English, lack of English, I didn't know. I left unlocked door. And my sister been inside, I cleaning outside the front of house, and mass pa a man passed me, and my sister said, somebody in house. I said, must be owner of house checking who live there. <laughs> and man took everything from wardrobe. <laughs> we don't have anything. And another thing, even more funny. Uh, Was that a burglar? Burglar. Oh, I see. Who was burglar in Longside. So they've been burglars, she said, and they didn't realize. <laughs> and you know what they took like that time? They have, we got the token for milk. Leila was small. <laughs> Baby milk tokens. <laughs> because we don't have anything. And second, uh, even more uh, funny, they register my children to school. They register. I've been lucky, be honest to you, meet people and they accept me like family. What you say, not because I am good, 
I think uh, God put me uh, to good people. Mm -hmm. They look after me. Even mosque, even Kesra, like Kesra, I will not forget, first Eid, she invited, uh, invited us in her house. She bought for all our children new clothes. And that Eid for me was like free Eid. We're not allowed to, to have free Eid. I said, will they maybe put her in prison? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, another uh, you true must story. Tell, tell them about the school children. What happened to your children? Uh, yeah, but you know they register my children to school. My son been little older than Leila, and in morning I take Leila to school. I thought to show her way, she will come back home because I didn't know. I don't know when children finish school in England because in Bosnia different time. This is true story. Three o'clock, uh, you know, because we have like shift uh, school, morning, then afternoon, because many children are not big uh, school. And Leila not come. Leila was just, uh, I think so, even not start school. And somebody knocked door uh, four o'clock and they taking my child with hand. And they telling me something, Leila looking me, I looking Leila. I looking teacher, look, teacher looking me, and they pointing me on her. <laughs> I not realize, I even Leila, small Leila, not know what is. Then they have somebody on phone, mm -hmm. the lady, I remember she said, uh, is it teacher in your house? I said, I don't know who is teacher, who is not. She said, but you didn't go pick up child from school. This is true because in Bosnia we are not taking children and bring them back. I take my daughter to school and left her. Okay, the uh, and thank you for that. We wanted something funny to cheer herself. <laughs> she can it's tell okay. many so it's okay. Just a couple of minutes for well, and sure. uh, yeah, because we're getting signals that we have a Yeah, well, uh, when I came here because I have the privilege of being a, a computer engineer in the Gulf. Uh, I have a good English skills, so I could help others who hasn't these uh, skills. So I worked for two years with uh, one uh, brilliant society, a charity called Rethink Rebuild Society, which is based here in Manchester alongside. I was like a, a refugee support officer. I helped the individuals and the families who came to UK to integrate, to find their new life here, especially in terms of education, employability, uh, and cultural exchange. Uh, we have something similar to MACFEST in, uh, in, uh, in, in Reading Re Rebuild Society. We celebrate the Syrian culture for the uh, local society. And then, because uh, Syrian uh, Rethink Rebuild Society uh, with cooperation of uh, another charity called Syria, Syria Relief. They run near the nearly 60 schools inside Syria. So I came to know more about the education uh, service and how important it is for to raise generation and to build communities, develop communities. I get interested in education and I studied for year here for uh, as a BGCE, the postgraduate uh, certificate in education and I'm now a licensed teacher in computer science and design technology. I'm teaching in Southport which is quite far from here but this is my life here in, in, in UK. I'm now a teacher as a profession uh, and um, I'm a part of management team for an Arabic school here in Manchester. And at the same time, I'm uh, uh, enjoying being volunteer for supporting refugees in Northwest. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I yes. Shall we just wrap it up? I think we are running out of time. We've got 15 minutes. Half past. past is nearly there. Uh, is there anybody desperate to ask one question? Then we'll leave it for the two. Is that okay? So we've got Esther in there. Okay. So remember, we only got literally two minutes to answer this, and then we have to finish. 
Thank you very much for sharing your story. So I personally really feel really sorry because as individual, I couldn't help much for you when you had a very hard time. So my question is that uh, we all know that there are many, like more than 50 countries, Muslim countries in the world. Uh, and then we couldn't help much because we are uh, separated by in invisible boundary and then we are busy with our own issues. And then uh, I'm just asking, how do you feel about that? And then, and then I'm just gonna say that it would have been wonderful if we have like, uh, we are united and then we always have a home to, co to go home without any without bothering about passport and visa and so on. I'm just asking about how do you feel about that. Thank you. Uh, it's quickly, it's like when you get fire in your home and you go down to street and say fire, it's not only you and your home uh, uh, people will leave the home. Everybody around you will leave their homes because they know this fire got possibly moved from one house to another till it demolished the whole area or the whole building what happened before in London. And if we consider the same point of view, the same perspective about the, the whole nations across the globe, we have to figure out that any fire set in any country, it will move to another country's there's no point of people to uh, overlook this or keep their eyes closed and don't see the fire in another part of the world because if we have this feeling that we are one, one family or one uh, group, we should feel the troubles, the problems in all parts of the world. Mm -hmm.